Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. When the personal computer came out, and that's when managers thought, for only four grand or five grand, I can buy each developer um, uh, uh, the, his or her own computer and really focus down on what that developer needs to do. So we mm-hmm. went, we had this interesting confluence of, of problems. Project management software that was focused on resource efficiency. What is each person doing separately? Mm-hmm. And a personal computer that allowed each person to focus down on their work. Who is Joanna Rothman? (laughs) Um, You might actually, if I'm being kind of a wise ass, um, Mm -hmm. I hope that I can say that on this podcast. You might have to edit that out. Um, I have a big mouth and I have I have a lot of experience in, in various contexts, not everybody's context, but a lot of experience. And I I apply that hard-earned experience to the issues of management and product development and everything that comes along with that. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, does that come from, uh, before I start recording, um, uh, we talked about how we're actually not too far from each other right now. I'm in Portland, Maine, you're in Arlington. Is that the New England edge? Uh, or is it something that uh, New Englanders uh, uh, is that part of uh, that big mouth, or in a uh, sense? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think it's. I think it's me. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I think it's. I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, no, I think that there are a lot more. I know a lot of other a lot of other people here who um, who are much calmer and and everything like that. So I actually uh, put in my bio, I offer frank advice. And that's, mm-hmm. so that helps get my clients, it helps my client, my potential clients um, uh, decide whether or not I'm the right person for them. Mm-hmm. That is great. Um, when it comes to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, books, you've written, close to 20 books, 18, I believe, right now in counting. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite one? No, that's like, that's <laughs> like asking if you have a favorite child. <laughs> no, I only no. have one child right now. So, you know, it's <laughs> for me, it's easy. So maybe I can't relate. <laughs> yeah, no, I have two children. Um, well, they're, they're grown, so it's hard. It's hard to call them children, but they are. Um, so I, every book is unique. I don't write the same book again and again. And I really don't like doing second editions. I do have some second editions, but I prefer not. I prefer to write a book and make it so it's um, not universal, but um, but long lived, right? Um, mm-hmm. not, not tied to a technology and tied to a time. So, and I've done, I've done a pretty good job with that. So um, I, for me right now, uh, since we are recording this and the Modern Management Made Easy books are out, um, the Modern Management Made Easy books are my favorite. And as soon as <laughs> a consulting book, that will be my favorite. <laughs> Great. Yeah. What is your process? I think I, I was listening to one of the podcasts. I don't know exactly which one. Um, and you talked about like, you know, the uh, discipline of writing every day. And, uh, um, you know, how do you get into that habit? Because like, I can relate a little bit to that because I started writing a book and that discipline of writing every day really made the difference. As soon as I stopped, <laughs> I stopped writing. It's been a while since I saw it. How, how, what would you recommend to those that hopefully in, you know want to write, but also like how do you get back out of that uh, writer's block? Is it just start writing again or like 
how what's your space how do you kind of uh uh not necessarily force yourself but uh help yourself focus on writing so what i really like what you said help yourself focus right because i i actually write in often in 15 minute blocks because i i'm busy just the same way everybody else is right so i did a little bit of writing before we got on this morning, I actually only did five minutes of writing. That's what I had. And I have, I put aside time on my calendar because it's been a crazy week. So today I actually have several one hour blocks, but I, I put inside those blocks to write in 15 minute increments. So I write for 15 minutes and then I, I tend to walk around because I need, I need to get my blood moving. I need to, I, I need a change of venue so that I have more ideas. And um, so for me, it's all about if you get out of the habit of writing, do the smallest thing you can to get back into the habit. And you don't need a lot of time. 15 minutes every single day is much more sustainable than an hour right exactly. at least in my experience yeah that's a very good advice and and again like i i can relate to it just because it is so tough and like if you think it's too big it's almost like you know what we talk about in agile you know those <laughs> be biased towards those smaller chunks of work and uh, uh, get those done um to come back to new england and uh summer uh would you, uh, where would you like to spend, is there a place, because for me, like between uh, Croatia and Montenegro and New England, I always debate, like, where would I rather spend the summer? Because I love summers in New England. Uh, is there another place for you besides New England? They, uh, or maybe you're more of a fall person, because uh, fall in New England is also uh, nice. Um, I really like it here. And I was just um, whining this morning to my husband that we we do not have enough money to buy a mansion on the Cape. We just don't. <laughs> and um, I would. There's something about the Cape that really calls to me. Cape Cod. For those mm -hmm. of for our our listeners who are not in in the New England area, um, uh, maybe because I went to camp on Cape Cod back when I was a kid, and I I loved it. It was it was a wonderful thing, and if I could be anywhere um, inside of water, that yeah. would be really good. Cave, yeah, but yeah. I'm not. So. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, the reason that I ask, uh, I've read uh, uh, one of your posts recently about reset, and you said, like, you know, summer is a good time for you to reset and uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, rethink what you're doing. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that, like why you think resets are and readjustments are important? Because I think in our, uh, you know, today's life, everything, I feel like I'm busier since COVID <laughs> and it's harder to reset because it's just a continuous kind of flow of both personal as well as work related stuff. So let's talk a little bit about reset. So in that, in that post, I believe it was around July 1st, somewhere around there. And I find that, so I always have goals for the year. And I, in order to achieve those goals, I break them down into monthly goals. And I use rolling wave planning for every single week because I have opportunities as a consultant to speak or consult or coach or something that I, I did not know about at the beginning of the week or the month of the year, but I want to be able to take advantage of some of those opportunities. So I'm always replanning in the small. However, if I don't track what I'm doing on a, for a yearly basis, then I don't actually make the progress I want to make in a year. So for example, I track the number of published words or publishable words I have, because I'm a writer, right? Mm -hmm. That's what writers do. We track the words. And I find that if I, if I don't track the words, I don't always get my 15 minutes of writing every day. So that's a reinforcing measure, right? It reinforcing good stuff. 
And then if I, if I look back at the first half of the year and I see where I am in relationship to where I wanted to be, mm-hmm. then I can say, well, what do I need to change? Now, some people do this quarterly. I find that still quarterly is, I'm still working on that, those small rolling waves mm-hmm. inside the larger months, inside the larger year already. Mm-hmm. If I'm if I'm not where I want to be at the at the halfway mark, I still yeah. have a chance to fix the year. And so you you are on a different fiscal year, kind of like government, you know, where it starts in uh, July versus like most of us, you know, think about like, oh, what am I gonna do at the end of the year? Uh, you know, what am I gonna, what are my goals for this year? But I really like the idea of reset of rethinking things in the summer. Um, uh, so, uh, that's, uh, that's something I'm going to try and, and uh, apply myself, but it's also that rolling kind of like, I, I really like, I've done that in the past, but I think we all can, uh, do a better job of, you know, kind of like what we preach about, talk about, actually apply it in our own work. <laughs> so I, I've been writing about rolling wave deliverable based planning since I think 96 or seven or eight or nine. Right. A long, long time. And I, I find that, um, I, I mean, I use this for my own work, right? Mm-hmm. That's how I get, people ask me all the time, how do you write so much? How do you talk so much? How do you, um, and I have the same number of hours as, as anybody else, but I use, that's why I find rolling wave deliverable based planning so helpful. And, and mm-hmm. that's one of the things we have as agile as agilists, right? Mm-hmm. We we might have a big goal for a product. Um, for me, that's a book or a workshop. And yeah. um, and I I cannot get it all done in one day or one week or even one month. Right. It's so, also easy to get overwhelmed. Like when I think about anything big, it's like it's easier to say no then yes so like you know when we think big it, it, you know when we chunk it down to smaller like you said i really like what you said earlier about like even if i can write for five minutes it, it's keeping me in that mindset of just keep going keep going keep going um because uh, that's i always thought like i need at least an hour you know and uh, you don't <laughs> yeah oh i i really increased my throughput when i started to write in less time Mm-hmm. So I used to, I used to always block out an hour and I needed to do it in an hour. Yeah. No, I, now I need 15 minutes and I write a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. And that's what we talk about in software development too, in a sense, like it's the same principle. <laughs> so applying it yeah. to, to writing is also, um, you recently talked about or uh, wrote about uh, work-life balance and what it means to you. Um, it's related to this topic because, uh, you know, that, that's important too. And uh, could you talk about that a little bit and bring some light to <laughs> that post? Sure. So um, I'm pretty open about the fact that I have vertigo. I have permanent vertigo. I'm always a dizzy broad, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I move my head and the world moves a little. I walk with a roll oh, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I... Yeah, it's right behind me. I, I walk all the time with a rollator because if I walk with my rollator, I can actually get exercise. I, I get nice and warm. I breathe hard. I get my heart rate up. It's everything I need. And the people in my neighborhood think I'm, I'm nuts. I don't care. I am nuts. This is totally fine. <laughs> However, if I don't balance my physical health, with my emotional health, with my um, intellectual and mental health, right? All of this mm-hmm. is really necessary for us. So I put my health first, because if I don't put my health first, I cannot be a good wife and a good mother, although I'm sure that my kids would like a little less mothering now. Um, and I, I cannot be a good consultant. I can definitely not be a good writer. So for me, it starts with how do I keep myself um, healthy in all ways? And then how do I extend my ability to keep myself healthy to my family, to my, to my work, 
to my clients, to my community, all that stuff. And, um, you know, I wrote in manage your job search that I don't, mm -hmm. I don't believe in work-life balance. You only have life and yeah. everybody needs to find what works for them in any given time of their lives. But mm -hmm. we all need to make our choices so that we optimize for what we need at the time. Do you think it's easier as a consultant versus, uh, and I work both as a consultant outside and inside companies and like, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have as well. And like, it's a little bit different when you're in a system that's, that, that's not also helping you make that decision, right? Uh, so what do you think our companies are doing today to help people make those? Because ultimately it is our decision, right? But companies can make it easier on employees to make that decision and to prioritize you know, what's important to them at any given moment. Um, I'm going to take a little issue with that. I'm yeah. going to say, well, while companies might make that easier for employees, my mm -hmm. experience is that very few managers actually think about that for mm -hmm. their staff, right? For the people that they lead and serve. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, back when I was a manager inside organizations, I was, if I had to give myself a rate, I was kind of 50 50 on, on, uh, on extending enough empathy to the people I led and served. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I am better at that now. I've certainly practiced a lot more, but I, yeah. I think it's really incumbent on people to say, I will work nine to five or 10 to six or, or, um, eight to 12, and then I need a few hours with the kids, um, and then I can come back to work. I, I had a job once as a manager where I, I was there from nine to five on the dot, mm -hmm. and sometimes only 4.30, depending on what my kids needed that day, right? So, and I went back to work after supper. I, I, I did a whole bunch of Report generation. I call. I did phone screens for um for, uh, for hiring people. I did. I worked after supper, but I had a very hard stop at the at probably earlier than they wanted any manager to actually finish for the day. But I I had small children. I needed to do mm. something like that, so I did. But that's about discipline, though. Like, you have to really be disciplined about what you do when you do it. Like, it, it goes back to writing, too. Because uh, <laughs> uh, in a sense, you know, you, you have to prioritize for yourself. So in, it, it's a two-way thing. And I, it, uh, what I'm getting, you know, uh, from this is sometimes uh, I've done this myself and I've seen others where, like, we kind of put it on others and half of the work we have to make sure that it's on us in a sense like I have to make that decision I'm gonna leave by 4 30 and I'm not gonna make excuses but I also know that I have to finish stuff so I'm gonna be uh, uh <laughs> this is about my time boxing and what I'm doing right yeah so I mean I told all the people I led I led, right? I was a manager for 17 people. Uh, and the, I explained to them, here's my day. If you mm -hmm. want me after, and, and this time where I'm with my kids, you don't get me. And mm -hmm. um, this is back before we had ubiquitous cell phones. So I gave, right. I gave my home phone number to the people in my team. And I said, mm -hmm. if you really, really need me, you can call me after 7.30 because husband is dealing with small children. I am back at work. And if you, if you really, really need me, if it cannot wait until the next day. And I gave my boss my home phone number and my, and my team. And I think it's, we all need to have boundaries about what, where we work, when we work, what we do. Um, I'm not sure if this is, Discipline, maybe it is. Um, back before I had the vertigo, I worked out every single morning, starting at about 6.30 in the morning. My husband and I got up at six. I was in the gym by 6.30. I was done by nine-ish, 8.30, whatever. whatever. I had uh, long workouts. So especially uh, when, I, when I was working from home as a consultant. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed 
having the discipline of going to the gym every single morning, Monday through Friday. I had different workouts for different days because, you know, that's what you do. But, uh, um, yeah, but I, I, I happen to like my routines. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's discipline or routines, but whatever it is, it works for me. It, 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 you wrote with, uh, I'm thinking about like remote and it is it, a lot of times, I guess, maybe harder. Um, and I'm going back to the book that you wrote with Mark on remote and distributed teams. Uh, what are some of the tips that you can uh, maybe give people? Is it, again, just routines when it comes to working from home? And it's a little bit harder sometimes because, uh, you know, kids are at home. Everybody's at home. More probably distractions, I'm assuming. You don't have, I know I struggle sometimes of finding time for myself because as soon as I'm done here, I walk out. <laughs> You're right there where like, you know, you ha- sometimes you had, the ride or whatever it is in between. What are some of the tips they would give people to deal and be more maybe disciplined or organized um, now that we're mostly distributed and remote? So the hours of overlap are so, so important. And when Mark and I offered an hours of overlap chart, and there's a a Google Doc that people can also um, use for themselves. We only had it in hours. And now what what I think I am pretty sure that Mark and I both agree, I would I would not do hours. I would do either 20 minute segments or 30 minute segments because Mm -hmm. we are not this is not normal remote work. We are all at home and our kids are with us. And I bet there are some parents out there who cannot wait for the start of school. They are just done being home with their kids. I, I actually said to Mark, my husband, as opposed to Mark Kilby, my, <laughs> my co-writer, um, I, I said to my husband, um, it's a good thing our children are old and grown and out of the house, because I'm not sure I would have made it. I, I, yeah, I mean, I would have, we all would have gone nuts. This house is not big enough for, for four people, all doing their own work. Uh, so I, I think that anybody who's home with children is just astonishing. But to go back to um, how I would do it is in 20 or 30 minute segments, you have the option of we will work together here. We will take a break here and we all need to do something else. We will be back at work together. Mm-hmm. So the more the more you um, can create those little time boxes. of mm-hmm when we will all be together and know in advance that you can all commit to that, um, mm-hmm. which means that anybody with a really small child, that's really hard. But if, um, anybody who with children who are able to manage themselves for 20 minutes at a time, this is still doable. And it's also easier to find maybe those smaller chunks. And a lot of times you just reconnect, realign, you know, um, or just, you know, from a communication standpoint, it's probably a lot easier to do something that we're doing here, video and uh, probably screen share rather than just, you know, emails. Uh, To come back to your kids, you recently wrote about how you judge or how you judge if something is good or how good something is. Uh, you used the analogy with uh, buying a dress for your uh, uh, second daughter. Could you maybe talk about that? I I, I enjoyed reading that as well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you're enjoying the Create an Adaptable Life blog. <laughs> Thank you. I'm never sure how many people actually read that. So um, a lot of a lot of um, mothers. Um, mothers of the bride, mothers of the groom, have these flowing long dresses and they look really lovely. And chiffon flows directly into the breaks of my row in her. And I discovered that the hard way at my older daughter's wedding. So I, I have very different criteria for this dress than I had for the first dress. And I, f- I find that that, especially if we think about that as an analogy, to the products that we create until mm-hmm. we start to put something in front of our users. They don't know what they really want and mm-hmm. their criteria change. And so we always hear, at least I used to always hear this 
um, a lot in, in the old days of software development. You gave me what I asked for, but it's not what I need. And when we can change that, and that's all about changing the criteria. How do we, how do we get to the point where we can see what we really need? So it's probably about learning that criteria evolves as you learn, right? Yeah. So I, I learned at my older daughter's wedding, <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm going to change that. I'm going to take that learning and change what I do for this next wedding. And I think a lot of us, um, we realize how differently we, we use technology now and mm -hmm. how we could use it in the future. And can we be perfect at this? Absolutely not. But we can be better at it. And that means we need more in um, more deliverables, more assessment as we go, and, and to be willing and open to changing the criteria. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole, yeah. I mean, like, in a sense, it's, it goes back to those outcomes. What are you trying to do? And, you know, in your instance, you're trying to be comfortable and enjoy your um daughter's wedding as well as look good so uh, whatever is gonna <laughs> uh get get to that outcome um maybe uh to switch gears uh, a little bit another thing that i found interesting is uh you wrote about policies and procedures and how they increase friction and that's really like you know a systemic i mean like uh you talked about how over the years we add policies we add and maybe at some point they made sense but a lot of times you know they're outdated or you know the, the context has changed um and as managers as leaders uh importance of understanding the the system and understanding the policies within that system and evolving those policies or maybe loosen up those policies uh so they're not as uh uh, you know, loosen up the guard rails, I guess. So could you talk about that? Like, what? why did you write that? Like, what triggered that uh, thought to, to write that article? Because I'm assuming you always have something that triggers an idea or a thought. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, several things. Um, almost all of these, a lot of the policies I see are because somebody made a mistake and we want to in effect, punish everybody else, or we're trying to manage risks of some sort. And the risks I see are often about money, but the policies and the mistakes are often about our product development. So I gave the example in there of management sign-off for deployment. And this one, this was a client of mine. They had wrapped themselves so far around the axle with asking for sign-offs that the managers no longer understood anything in the code, mm -hmm. right? So the managers had to sign off on deployment, but they didn't know anything in the code. I mean, I asked these people, do you, what, do you know about the internals? No, no, no. My, my people tell me what's going on. Okay, fine. Which, my piece, and because yeah. They, yeah. And because they had all these sign-offs, they needed a separate deployment team so the deployment team did not know what was in the code. And if, if they did not deploy in the right order, which was the example I gave, um, then they did an upgrade to the database before they did all of the preparation for the upgrade to the database. They had no way to roll back. Well, no easy way to roll back. And so all of this, risk management with sign-offs and a separate deployment team actually created the exact problem that they wanted to avoid. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, what would it take for you to be comfortable with having a team, just choose any team at all, um, deploy on Monday and then another team to deploy on Tuesday, another team to, to deploy on Wednesday. What mm -hmm. would it take for you to be comfortable with that? They said, well, a whole lot more testing. Okay, um, maybe go to a staging server and test it there first. I said, okay, um, right. How, how can you get comfortable with going to production right away? What would it take? Mm -hmm. So we talked about their continuous integration and then, and then their pipeline to get to continuous delivery. And mm -hmm. they're not continuous in the sense of, 
what a lot of other people think is continuous now, where any team can deploy at the end can deploy at any time. But it's a but step probably in have, the right direction, yeah. Yeah, they do have automated deployment from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. and then a whole bunch of testing as they go. And, mm -hmm. and they always have somebody on call. I'm not so excited about that, but nobody has to respond until 6 a.m. So they have a system that's working better that does allow for more trust. And at some point, maybe they will just deploy during the day. I, yeah. I live in hope that that happens. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I think it's so hard for managers to trust when, when something goes wrong, everybody feels badly. And instead mm -hmm. of, of saying, how do we recover faster from that? That's when they put all these policies and procedures in place. And so there is that the connection between policies and procedure risk recently, I, or I saw somewhere I've written here, uh, every agile approach manages certain risk, right? And then there's trust. So policies and procedures, risks and trust. So when it comes to managers, what you just said, like my people or my peeps got it, I don't have to worry about, you know, this risk management in traditional sense and from traditional project management was something that project manager was responsible for. Maybe you would have a risk management team, but it wasn't really, you know, what we talk about in Agile where it's like distributed and everybody's responsible for risk, you know, and everybody's should be having their eyes open. And, 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 you know, when it comes to risk and we should have trust <laughs> to make sure that we're not putting policies in, 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 uh, in place. How have you seen this distribution of, or take on like a lot of times developers or uh, I mean, developers, anybody on the scrum team, anybody that's doing the work has a difficult time accepting that they need to manage their own work or that they actually need to manage risk. So how do you help people understand? I'm assuming that you, you agree that they should be thinking about risk. They should be thinking about managing their own work. How do we help people like that maybe see the value in managing risk and managing their own work? So this is where thinking about outcomes versus outputs is so, mm -hmm. so important. Um, I am a huge fan of having a product goal Right. We are doing this product for these people, for these kinds of outcomes. And if we always think about that as we create smaller stories, and mm -hmm. if we always think about that as we integrate um, performance and security into everything that we do, then we are much more likely to reach the outcomes that we want and manage risk as we proceed. Mm -hmm. So... This is a function of the project owner, the possibly the project managers, and where management cannot take that away from the people on the team, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you delegate a problem and its outcomes to a team, right, it may be in the form of a product, maybe in the form of a service, then you cannot take it back, right? Mm -hmm. That's really important. You cannot be wishy-washy about, yeah, you have the responsibility and you have the authority to do this. And then on Friday afternoon, no, I'm not happy. I'm going to take it back. You cannot do that as a manager in, in any management form, right? I don't Ooh. care if you're called a scrum master or a project manager or a people manager. You have to, once you offer the team the, um, the problem and the outcomes, that's the real delegation. You cannot take it back at any time. And that's, I think, really important point, which is hard. And also like, it's a mindset like for, we've been so like conditioned over the years, right? To, to think certain way, to work certain way. Um, one of those is that, hey, you know, I have a manager and they're responsible for everything. I'm just gonna go in code or test or do my job. And that's, uh, obviously changing, but like um, I was teaching a class here at University of Maine and kids today and in general, like are not thinking the way or they're not being conditioned in a way to think about it. They're like, I'm a full stack developer. I'm a problem solver. I need to think about the customer. I should be talking to the customer. And a lot of times like uh, 
when I work with clients, especially like larger companies or government agencies, it's like, you know, I'm a backend developer on this application, don't ask me to do anything else, right? Uh, so a little bit of that is, uh, uh, I, I think, conditioning. And uh, I know like you, I wrote or I read that, that you know, uh, your earlier days or late 1970s, early 1980s, you worked on cross-functional themes. So what got me thinking is like, it, you know, like what has changed when you reflect back, like what did the themes look like then? Because a lot of times when I talk to people, they say like we're agile back then and we're doing some of this stuff. So maybe could you take us down memory lane and talk about like, you know, how some of this stuff uh, back in 70s, 80s was, you, you know, kind of all about, had the same principles that we talk about. And uh, it, at least to me, uh, it would be interesting because I've talked to people and they, they they tell me stories about like, you know, Agile wasn't, you know, born in 2001. Uh, oh, this way no. of working yeah. uh, was so... What are some of the, when you reflect, what are some of the thoughts that come to mind? When you look so at up until, up until 1985, when the personal computer came out, we all had to share computers, right? We had either mainframes or mini computers. So on my first job out of school, um, we, ha we had a mainframe and there was the guy who did the JCL and, um, and we had key punch ladies which was kind of crazy because in college, I'd actually worked on, on a, a time-sharing operating system. So we all had our, our own monitors. Um, we, had, we had time slices on the computer itself, but it was, mm -hmm. I was used to a keyboard, not a key punch. Yeah, fine. Um, but we had, there were no formal testers on our very large program in 1977. We had developers and we all looked at each other's design. We all looked at each other's code. We had religious design reviews, religious code reviews, and religious um, testing as a team. Mm -hmm. right, so the team would go into the lab and say, is this working now? So we did not have um, in, in supposedly independent verification and validation. Um, that worked out fairly well. I have a funny story of when I went to implement conference calling for a telephone system, I made it so that the general could only listen and everybody else talked. <laughs> I flipped the bit. Fine. Um, he had a really good uh, attitude about this because I, I said to him, I have not tested um, this. This is the first time I've tested it. And he's he's he said to me, go flip that bit the other way, fine. Um, but um, then when I worked on a mini computer on, on analytical chemical instrumentation, there were seven or eight of us as in the software department, right? We had a department. We, again, we, uh, reviewed each other's code and design. We tested with each other and for each other because when I'm in development mode, I don't mm. see the same things as when I'm in testing mode. And then I, I worked on uh, machine vision systems on um, specific, on, I guess, proprietary hardware. So we all had access to the operating system. We all had access to all the libraries and we changed what we needed to do. I mean, we had to get, if we wanted to change the operating system, we really needed to get permission from everybody else. Did we really want to change the OS? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not. So. Well, we all work together as cross-functional teams. And I think in, um, for those first couple of machine vision uh, companies on mini computers, I found that um, we, were, we worked in small chunks. Were the chunks as small as they are now? No, um, except for me, because I had, I had learned about the 90% done schedule game in my first job out of school. Um, I was 90% done for five weeks and my, well, I, I went to 91%, 92%, 92.5%. .92 my boss finally took pity on me. And I, he said, would you like to know what secret? I said, yes, because I have no idea when this is going to be done. And he told me about inch pebbles, right? One to two day tasks that are either done or not done. Does mm -hmm. this sound like small stories to you? 
So I, I started to use inch pebbles in 1977 because that's when I, I knew I was totally broken on this particular project. Um, and when, when you use inch pebbles and rolling wave planning, it looks a lot like what we do as Agilists now. Not exactly the same. I did not use test driven development. I was not that smart. In fact, I, I sneered at it for clean room, just sneered at it. So I, we, I did not do everything back then, but a lot of what we use now, I have been using since the seventies. And the big change came in 1985 and 86 when the personal computer came out. And that's when managers thought for only four grand or five grand, I can buy each developer um, uh, uh, the, his or her own computer and really focus down on what that developer needs to do. So we went, we had this interesting confluence of, of problems. Project management software that was focused on resource efficiency. What is each person doing separately? And mm -hmm. a personal computer that allowed each person to focus down on their work. And, the and that's when we started measuring lines, <laughs> whole code and all of that, right? Yeah. So that really changed how well it reinforced how managers thought about managing and how mm -hmm. project managers um, thought about managing. And that's, I am convinced that that's why the Agile Manifesto was born. <laughs> to, to bring us back and to yeah. go back to, yeah. Yeah. That's really well, interesting. Years, yeah. yeah. 15 years of resource efficiency thinking was horrible. Mm -hmm. Assuming that we can get the, you know, people confused with being busy developers writing code and getting stuff done. Um, and if you look at it from that side, well, you can get uh, easily confused. Um, <clears throat> I wanted maybe to switch a little bit here. Um, I was interested in, I wanted to get your thought. Um, you recently collaborated with the Business Agility Institute on their journal number four titled Reclaiming Management. Um, so I wanted to uh, get your thoughts first on, has management become a dirty word? Like a lot of times people now use management and it's like, you know, it's a dirty word, like, oh, you know, management is bad or, so I wanted to ask you first that, and then maybe you could, if you could elaborate on what did you learn from um, being the editor and being involved in that project? So I think that for too many Agilists, management is a dirty word because they, they use control, command and control as equivalency for management. And management's job is not about command and control. Management's job is to create the environment where everybody can succeed for a greater purpose, for that overarching goal, to answer the why, to answer the value that each person, each team, each product brings to the organization. So management is all about the culture, creating and refining the culture that will create great products, right? If we, mm -hmm. if we have a culture that people can really succeed in, they will create great products. So management is all about of the, the guardrails and constraints mm -hmm. that allow people to do great work. Designing and, the system in a sense, right? Yes, yes. Okay. If managers are not meta about the work, about the system, the environment, the culture, then managers are probably commanding and, and controlling, not mm -hmm. all that useful. So, and what I learned from, from this issue, so I've been a technical editor for, um, for agileconnection.com for six years, um, several years ago. And I, I really enjoyed it. I really love um, helping writers find their voice, um, show their gems, their thoughts mm. that are really useful. So I really enjoy that. But I don't want to be a book doctor or any, any of that. <laughs> that's, uh. No, that's not for me. Um, that's why I offer writing workshops because I want people to be able to do that for themselves. And when I learned, I had such a good time with this, with this issue. First of all, there were several other people I wanted to invite for this issue because they've been doing really, really great work about um, agile management. And I, I could not invite them. I, um, Evan Laybourne, the, the BAI uh, leader, 
director, whatever he's called, said, Johanna, you have to keep to a word count. Fine. <laughs> I will keep to my word count. Well, right. If you have to, you really have to worry about the word count for the paper count. Yeah, fine. Um, so I, I had a strict word count. Well, not strict, but a boundary. Probably a range, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A boundary. So I had to really manage my desire for all the people I really wanted. <laughs> that was that was a challenge. Um, and I got some wonderful essays from amazing people um, who you might or might not know. So um, let me see if I can find my, I'm gonna find my. Um, yeah, I had my, that list. I actually took a look at it. I don't know if I have a handy, but I definitely looked at the articles and the uh, people on that list and I agree uh, it's. Uh, well, it's a combination of consultants and practitioners. Right. Mm -hmm. So, which is Kat always Swatel, a good mix. <laughs> yeah. Kat, Doc Norton, um, um, Boris Glover, Jeffrey Frederick, um, uh, Barry O'Reilly, uh, Gunter, um, Esther Derby, and Douglas Squirrel yeah. are all consultants and well known, really smart people. And then there's Sean Flaherty and um, a case study by, by Barry O'Reilly and Steve Leist. So we have a nice mixture of real practitioners, people who might speak about this, but only in, in their kind of a context and a whole bunch of other people who are who have seen many instances of interesting management and agile, agility and agile management. So I'm, I'm really happy about this. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. It's coming out. Uh soon right it's not out yet it's not out yet and uh, um all i know is when i was supposed to be done so. <laughs> i think I mean, uh, i'm assuming next couple of months but yeah uh you I talked think, about yeah yeah we'll we'll let people know yeah yeah, yeah. So i think so because the other report is kind of yeah uh, so one of the things that maybe to come back to you said you know managers are responsible for creating a culture uh, how do they do that? What's culture? I mean, like we talk about culture and mindset in these terms, but nobody really, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. So maybe what is your definition of culture and uh, how do managers and leaders help create a culture? Or maybe so some of the ways. I, yeah. yeah, I've adapted my, um, my definition from Shine because I find mm -hmm. that Shine has artifacts, values, assumptions. They all get me confused and they're not concrete. So the concrete thing is there are three pieces of the concrete pieces of culture. There's what can people discuss? Mm -hmm. How do we treat each other? And what do we reward? And of, the, of all three of those, what do we reward is the most important piece. If we say we don't want firefighting, but we reward individual work that looks like firefighting, <laughs> Then, yeah. then that's what we reward, right? Mm -hmm. And if we say, oh, we reward, if we reward managers on th their deliverables, managers are not going to extend trust to the people who need to do the work. They are not going to delegate work to people in terms of outcomes, right? Not mm -hmm. problems and outcomes. So the rewards drive so much of the culture and the rewards are so, so hard to change and that's it's and it's also that, that that's that interplay between the rewards and the system and behavior and then you know what type of culture we create um which is a lot of times you know uh, especially in the organizations that most of us deal with work with um <clears throat> where we have a lot of layers and hierarchy where um you know people that can change the policies and those rewards is small percentage of people in the organization. So for those managers and leaders to be able to do that, to enable the type of culture that's uh, maybe healthier for today's environment is key. And uh, I think, you know, uh, I've been looking and uh, interviewing people from uh, HR, and I think HR and finance is finally catching up to understand what role they play 
in this movement and how they need to help organization change those policies and maybe loosen up the guardrails so uh, people can have a little bit more flexibility in defining those policies uh, so <laughs> managers can do their job in a sense and leaders can do their job. Well, if we can get finance to move away from managing with cost accounting to managing mm -hmm. by throughput, that mm -hmm. would be a huge thing. They still have to report in cost accounting terms. Yeah, and that's, that's a problem, but it would change the whole dynamic for the project portfolio. Instead of asking people to predict when they would be done or how much it's going to cost, they could change the conversation to ask, how much do we want to invest for now? What's the cost of delay of not having this thing? Are there any other pieces that would help the entire organization if we did them to reduce the friction all through the organization, right? They would change the conversation. And if we could get HR to, um, to drive moving away from personal individual rewards, we still need we still need some of that. And the teams are much more likely to know who has actually done a good job and who has not, right? Mm -hmm. In an agile team, there's not a lot of room for hiding. So regulating. <laughs> yeah, it's much more self-regulating. And uh, if we can move away from just individual rewards to a combination of rewards um, and based on outcomes, based on the team's value, I think that we are much more likely to succeed. Right. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, for the last topic here, um, the podcast is called Agile to Agility. And I talked about, you know, how, you know, last 20 years were a lot about just Agile, doing Agile. I hope the next 20 years will be about Agile and Agility because those two go together. Um, and I want to tie back uh, another thing that you wrote, which I really liked about finite and infinite games. Uh, when we look at our Agile community, um, and what has happened and what, where we're kind of going, uh, what do you think? You know, are we playing the finite or infinite games? Uh, where do you think Agile is going? Um, what are the next maybe five years, 10 years? I don't know. Uh, you've seen it all. So do you have any insights <laughs> into where we might be going? So i got to tell you, I'm an eternal optimist, right? So I need to, I need to preface it with that. Um, I really hope that we stop fighting about the frameworks. Mm -hmm. I find frameworks, well, some frameworks are sort of useful. Some are um, not comprehensible to me. I will okay. just stop there. And I find that the more we think about how do we use all the information we have for better business outcomes, and if we start to focus on business outcomes, we are much more likely to get agility. Um, I actually am working with a client right now. It's a small client, so I'm not sure if this is um, generally kind of transferable to anybody else, where I said to them, don't worry about the teams. The teams are smart. They will figure out they want to use Scrum, they want to use Flow. Um, does not matter. Whatever they want to use, it's totally going to be fine. But what really matters is that the, the managers have this the same overarching goal and that their job is to create business outcomes, not outputs. And so if you get the managers to collaborate, that will be, that will enable you to get to business agility. And they said, I don't know, Johanna, right? This is six months ago. I don't know, you're kind of looking crazy over there. I said, what have you got to lose, right? Try it for three months and see what happens. But, and so I've been coaching them all this time. They, they had this enormous breakthrough where, and of course I'm, on, I'm under NDA. I cannot talk about who the client is or where they are, um, but they had this enormous breakthrough and the teams are collaborating in ways that they had never collaborated before because the managers 
all had the same overarching goal. Mm -hmm. Alignments, now, right? Teams, <laughs> yeah. Some teams use Scrum. Some teams use um, Flow. There, are, there's a couple of programs that are using Safe. That's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I, as long as they deliver on a regular cadence for the, those overarching business outcomes, that's what really matters. And yeah. this company is having their best quarter ever. And th that points to, you know, I've talked to several top leaders and it's the same message. Essentially, um, we got to start thinking for ourselves and start contextualizing. You won't see any more like where, you know, you've probably been part of, a, I, you know, I have like where, you know, a publicly traded company of, you know, thousands of people, everybody gets trained in Scrum or Kanban, it's one or the either. And, uh, you know, everybody has to do it this way or safe or whatever it is. And I think what we're heading into is more of contextualizing things, not written necessarily like you just explained. It's like, you know, give things freedom to understand what their context is and design whatever works for them rather than limiting, limiting them to a specific framework or, you know, way of working. So, um, very interesting. Um, maybe as a last thing, what message? What do you want to leave us with uh, uh, for the end? So I would like you to think for agility, I would really like you to think about what business outcomes can I contribute to and who do I need to work with to contribute to them, right? How can we work as a team of um, uh a cross-functional product team, a team of managers at all levels to, to really focus on business outcomes so that we deliver what we want so, so our, our customers are happy right, for agility. And um, I, I, I will try doing my marketing thing. I'm not very good at this, so I'll, I'll try anyway. I offer a quarterly writing workshop that really helps people get out of their heads and get words on paper. So if people are interested in that, they should email me or contact me in some way. 